Today is day one for the Come Follow Me readings for this week, April 24th through the 30th, John 7 through 10. I am the Good Shepherd. Monday, April 24th, 2023, John 7. Improving Personal Study. Look for inspiring words and phrases. As you read, the Spirit may bring certain words or phrases to your attention that inspire or motivate you to, or seem to be written just for you. Consider making note of any words or phrases that inspire you in John 7-10. through 10. As you read John 7-10, through 10, you may receive impressions from the Holy Ghost about the doctrinal principles in these chapters. Recording your impressions can help you make a plan to act on them. Although Jesus Christ became came to bring peace and goodwill toward men, there was a division among the people because of him. People who witnessed the same events came to very different conclusions about who Jesus was. Some concluded, he is a good man, while others said, he deceiveth the people. When he healed a blind man on the Sabbath, some insisted this man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. While others asked, How can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? Yes, yet despite all the confusion, those who searched for truth recognized the power in his words, for never man spake like this man. When the Jews asked Jesus to tell us plainly whether he was the Christ, he revealed a principle that can help us distinguish truth from error. My sheep hear my voice. He said, and I know them, and they follow me. Opposition increases in Galilee. John 7, 1. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry because the Jews sought to kill him. The Jews referred to in, seven, in John 7, 1 are the Jewish leaders, not the Jewish public in general. Urged to attend the Feast of Tabernacles. Under the law of Moses, ancient Israel celebrated three great annual pilgrimage fest feasts during which many Jews traveled to Jerusalem. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, or the Passover, the Feast of Harvest, or the Feast of Weeks, or Pentecost, and the Feast of Ingathering, or Tabernacles. In, Jewish, in, the, in New Testament times, the Feast of Tabernacles was considered the, great and most, the greatest and most joyful of the feasts celebrated in the modern months of September and October. The events celebrated were the sojourning of the children of Israel in the wilderness and the gathering in of all the fruits of the year. During the week-long celebration, Israelites occupied booths, also called tabernacles, that they built out of palm and myrtle branches. More sacrifices were offered at the temple during this week than during any other religious commemoration. The events recorded in John 7 occurred during the week of the Feast of Tabernacles. Jesus had been staying in the Galilee area, where he had experienced great popularity and avoiding the regions surrounding Jerusalem because they were heavily influenced by Jewish leaders who sought to kill him. John 7, 2, and... Now the Jews, Jews' Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. What was the Feast of Tabernacles? The fifteenth day of the seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles of seven days unto the Lord. The Feast of Tabernacles was a time to rejoice and to express gratitude for the Lord for the rich harvests of the fertile lands of Palestine. Fields and vineyards were often some distance from Israelite villages. So families could build temporary living quarters for the harvest season and week-long celebration. These dwellings were decorated with fruits and garlands, which represented the bountiful harvest received from the Lord. They also served to remind the occupants of the 40 years their ancestors spent in the wilderness encamped in makeshift tents or whatever, of whatever materials they could find. The Jews were never to forget that God redeemed their people from captivity and bondage. The special animal sacrifices of rams, lambs, and bullocks were offered daily. The people also participated in a ceremony in which they waved branches of palm, myrtle, willow, and citron trees up and down toward 
the cardinal points of the compass, symbolizing the, the presence of God throughout the universe. The eighth day, the Feast of Conclusion, was a time of solemn assembly, a day of prayer for rain, and a day commemorated in mem memory of the dead. John 7, 3-9 his brethren, therefore, said unto him, Depart hence, and go into, into Judea, that thy disciples there also may see the works that thou doest. His brethren, mentioned in verse 3, are Jesus' half-brothers. Jesus' half-brothers urged him to go to Jerusalem to the Feast of Tabernacles. Jesus told them no, but he later went to the feast secretly and began to teach in the temple. For there is no other, for there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, shew, show thyself to the world. For neither did his brethren believe him, believe in him. Then Jesus said unto them, My time is not yet come, but your time is always is always ready. The world cannot hate you. But me it hateth, because I testify of it, that the works thereof are evil. Go ye up unto the, this feast. I go not up yet unto this feast, for my time is not yet full come. When he had said these words unto them, he continued still in Galilee. Jesus attends the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem. John seven ten through 13 but after his brethren were gone up, they then went he also up unto the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. When the Jews sought him at the feast and said, Where is he? Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, Where is he? And there was much murmuring among the people concerning him. For some said, He is a good man. Others said, Nay, but he deceiveth the people. Howbeit no man spake openly of him, for fear of the Jews. The Doctrine of the Father As Jesus taught in the temple during the Feast of Tabernacles, some Jews marveled that he could teach as he did without having studied their theology. Jesus taught these people that his doctrine came from his Father, and that those who applied the doctrine would know of its truth. John seven fourteen through 17 Now about the mist of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, <clears throat> How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? The Jews marveled that Jesus knew so much, since he was not learned, at least not in the ways they were familiar with. In Jesus' response, he taught a different way of knowing truth that is available to everyone, <clears throat> regardless of education or background. <clears throat> And Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. <clears throat> According to John 7, 14 through 17, how can you come to know that the doctrine Jesus taught is true? Keeping the commandments will help me know they are true for younger children. Jesus taught that we can gain a testimony of the truths he shared as we live them. The peace we feel when we obey the commandments helps us to know they are true. President Bonnie L. Oscarson, former Young Women General President, gave the following counsel about coming to know truth. Sometimes we try to do it backward. For example, <clears throat> we may take we may take this approach. I will be happy to live the law of tithing, but first I need to know that it's true. Maybe we even pray to gain a testimony of the law of tithing and hope the Lord will bless us with that testimony before we have ever filled out a tithing slip. It just doesn't work that way. The Lord expects us to exercise faith. We have, the consistent, we have to consistently pay a full and honest tithe in order to gain a testimony of tithing. The same pattern applies to all the principles of the gospel. Whether it is the law of chastity, the principle of modesty, the word of wisdom, or the law of the fast. What did what test did Jesus prescribe to know the truthfulness of his doctrine? David O. McKay said, In searching the record as it is given to us by men, 
who associated daily with the Lord, we find that upon one occasion, men who were listening to him cried out against him. They opposed his works as men today oppose him. And one voice cried out and said, in effect, how do we know that what you tell us is true? How do we know that you, your profession to be the son of God is true? And Jesus answered him in just a simple way and note the test. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. The test is not is most sound. It is most philosophical. It is the most simple test to give knowledge to an individual of which the human mind can conceive. Doing a thing, introducing it into your very being, will convince you whether it is good or whether it is bad. You may not be able to convince me of that which you know, but you know it because you have lived it. That is the test that the Savior gave to those men when they asked him how they should know whether the doctrine of the of God or whether it whether the doctrine was of God or whether it was of men. Of this teaching, President James E. Faust of the First Presidency said, We acquire a testimony of the principles of the gospel by obeying, obediently trying to live them. Said the Savior, If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine. A testimony of the efficacy of prayer comes through humble and sincere prayer. A testimony of Testimony of tithing comes by paying tithing. A testimony that if you continue in the purpose, in the purposeful per process of searching for and accepting spiritual light, truth, and knowledge, it will surely come. By going forward in faith, you will find that your faith will increase. In John seven seventeen, the Savior gave us a formula to know the truth of his doctrine. Choose a doctrine or principle of the gospel about which you would like to strengthen your testimony. Then write out a plan for what you can do to strengthen your testimony of that truth. After a week or two of striving to strengthen your testimony of that doctrine, write in your journal what you have learned so far. How has the pro this process helped you develop your testimony of the gospel? What is the value of seeking truth through obedience? The Savior told his disciples that those who continue to live his teachings would come to know the truth of that and that his truth would give them freedom. President Dieter F. Uchtdorf of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained why we would want to make the effort to receive a personal testimony of the truth. Some may say that the steps are too hard or that they are not worth the effort, but I suggest that this personal testimony of the gospel and the church is the most important thing you can earn in this life. It will not only bless and guide you during this life, but it will also have a direct bearing on your life throughout eternity. President Teter F. Uchtdorf said, Dear brothers and sisters, living the gospel faithfully is not a burden. It is a joyful rehearsal, a preparation for inheriting the grand glory of the eternities. We seek to obey our Heavenly Father because our spirits will become more attuned to spiritual things. Vistas are opened that we never knew existed. Enlightenment and understanding come to us when we do the will of the Father. Keeping the commandments will help me know they are true for younger children. Obeying the commandments helps us feel closer to Jesus Christ.
There's a right way to live and be happy. It is choosing the right every day. I am learning the teachings of Jesus. They will help me and show me the way. Choose the right way and be happy. I must always choose the right. Through the gospel I learn to be prayerful, to have faith, to repent, to obey. And I know if I live by his teachings, I will truly be happy each day. Choose the right way and be happy. John 7, 18-24 He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory, but he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Do, did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you keepeth the law? Why, you, why go ye about to kill me? The people answered and said, Thou hast a devil. Thou goest, thou goest about to kill thee? Who goeth about to kill thee? Jesus answered and said unto them, I have done no work, and and yet ye mar and yet all marvel. Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers. And ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. If a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are ye angry at me, because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? Many Jews refused to listen to Jesus because he believed he was not they believed he was not obeying the Mosaic law which over the centuries had become corrupted they were angry with him because he had healed a man on the sabbath day which was not allowed by the Mosaic law of that time judge not according to your traditions but judge righteous judgment to help your family understand Jesus's teachings and John 724 you might show them something that looks one way on the outside but is different on the inside or family members could share experiences that taught them not to judge on by outward appearances you could also list qualities of each family member that aren't visible to the eye see also first samuel 16 7 the lord said unto samuel look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature because i have refused him for the lord seeth not as man seeth for man looketh on the outward appearance but the lord looketh on the heart jesus taught them judge not according to your traditions but judge righteous judgment this is an important doctrine not only for the jews in jesus's day but for our time as well at times we may need to abandon certain traditions in order to keep the laws of god My dear brethren, twice each year, this magnificent conference center is filled to capacity with the priesthood of God as we gather to hear messages of inspiration. There's a marvelous spirit which permeates the general priesthood meeting of the church. This spirit emanates from the conference center and headers every building where the sons of God assemble. We have surely felt that spirit tonight. Some years ago, before this beautiful conference center was built, a visitor to Temple Square in Salt Lake City attended a general conference session in the tabernacle. 
He listened to the messages of the brethren. He paid attention to the prayers. He heard the beautiful music by the tabernacle choir. He marveled at the grandeur of the magnificent tabernacle organ. When the meeting had ended, he was heard to say, I would give everything I possess if I knew that what those speakers said today was true. In essence, he was saying, I wish that I had a testimony of the gospel. There is absolutely nothing in this world that will provide more comfort and happiness than a testimony of the truth. Although to varying degrees, I believe every man or young man here tonight has a testimony. If you feel that you do not yet have the depth of testimony you would wish, I admonish you to work to achieve such a testimony. If it is strong and deep, labor to keep it that way. How blessed we are to have a knowledge of the truth. My best message tonight, brethren, is that there are countless individuals who have little or no testimony right now. Those who could and would receive such a testimony if we would be willing to make the effort to share ours and to help them change. In some instances, we can provide the incentive for change. I mentioned first those who are members but who are not at all present fully committed to the gospel. Many years ago at an area conference held in Helsinki, Finland, I heard a powerful, memorable, and motivating message given in a mothers and daughters session. I have not forgotten that message, though nearly 40 years have passed since I heard it. Among many truths the speaker discussed, she said that a woman needs to be told she is beautiful. I read it again. A woman needs to be told she is beautiful. She needs to be told she's valued. She needs to be told that she's worthwhile. Brethren, I know that men are very much like women in this regard. We need to be told that we amount to something, that we're capable and worthwhile. We need to be given a chance to serve. For those members who have slipped from activity or who hold back and remain noncommittal, we can prayerfully seek for some way to reach them. Asking them to serve in some capacity may just be the incentive they need to return to full activity. But those leaders who could help in this regard are sometimes reluctant to do so. We need to bear in mind that people can change. They can put behind them bad habits. They can repent from transgressions. They can bear this priesthood worthily, and they can serve the Lord diligently. May I provide a few illustrations? When I first became a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, I had the opportunity to accompany President N. Eldon Tanner, the counselor to President David O. McKay, to a state conference in Alberta, Canada. During the meeting, the state president read the names of four brethren who had qualified to be ordained elders. These were men whom President Tanner knew, for at one time he had lived in that area. But President Tanner knew and remembered them as they once were and did not know that they had turned their lives around and had fully qualified to become elders. The president of the stake read the name of the first man and asked him to stand. President Tanner whispered to me, Look at him! Look at him! I never thought he'd make it. The stake president read the name of the second man, and he stood. Brent Tanner nudged me again and reported his astonishment. And so it was with all four of the brethren. After the meeting, President Tanner and I had the opportunity to congratulate these four brethren. They had demonstrated that men can change. During the 1940s and 1950s, 
an American prison warden, Clinton Duffy, was well known for his efforts to rehabilitate the men in his prison, said one critic, don't you know that lepers can't change their spots? Replied Warden Duffy, you should know that I don't work with leopards. I work with man, and men change every day. Many years ago, it was my opportunity to serve as president of the Canadian Mission. There we had a branch with very limited priesthood. We always had a missionary presiding over the branch. I received a strong impression that we needed to have a member of the branch preside there. We had one adult member in the, that branch who was a deacon in the Aaronic priesthood who didn't attend or participate enough to be advanced in the priesthood. I felt inspired to call him as the branch president. I shall always remember the day that I had an interview with him. I told him that the Lord had inspired me to call him to be the president of the branch. After much protest on his part, and much encouragement on the part of his wife, he indicated he would serve. I ordained him a priest. It was the beginning of a new day for that man. His life was quickly put in order, and he assured me that he would live the commandments as he was expected to live them. In a few months, he was ordained an elder. He and his wife and family eventually went to the temple and were sealed. Their children served missions and married in the house of the Lord. Sometimes letting our brethren know that they are needed and valued can help them take that step into commitment and full activity. This can be true of priesthood oldest regardless of age. It is our responsibility to give them opportunities to live as they should. We can help them to overcome their shortcomings. We must develop the capacity to see men not as they are at present, but as they may become when they receive testimonies of the gospel of Christ. I once attended a meeting in Leadville, Colorado. <laughs> it wasn't a great big city. Leadville situated at an altitude of over 10,000 feet. I remember that particular meeting because of the high altitude. But I also remember it for what took place that evening. There were just a small number of priesthood holders present. As with the branch in the Canadian mission, that branch was presided over by a missionary and always had been. That night we had a lovely meeting, but as we were singing the closing song, the inspiration came to me that there ought to be a local branch president presiding. I turned to the mission president and asked, isn't there someone here who could preside a local man? He replied, I don't know of one. During the singing of that song, I looked carefully at the men who were seated on the first three rows. My attention seemed to be focused on one of the brethren. I said to the mission president, could he serve as the branch president? He replied, I don't know. Perhaps he could. I said, President, I'll take him into the other room and interview him. You speak after the closing song. I keep singing other songs until we return. <laughs> when the two of us walked back to the room, the mission president concluded his testimony. I presented the name of the brother to be the new branch president. From that day forward, Leadville, Colorado, had a local member leaving the unit there. The same principle, brethren, applies to those who are not yet members. We should develop the capacity to see men not as they are, but as they can become when they're members of the Church, when they have a testimony of the Gospel, and when their lives are in harmony with his teaching. Back in the year 1961, the worldwide conference was held for mission presidents, and every mission president in the church 
I went to Salt Lake City for those meetings. I came to Salt Lake City for my mission in Toronto, Canada. In one particular meeting, an elder Tanner, who was then an assistant to the Quorum of the Twelve, had just returned from his initial experience of presiding over the missions in Great Britain and Western Europe. He told of a missionary who had been the most successful missionary whom we met in all of the interviews he conducted. He said that as he interviewed that missionary, he said to him, I suppose that all of the people whom you baptized came into the church by way of referrals. The young, young man answered, No. We found them all by tracting. Brother Tanner asked him what was different about his approach. Why he had such phenomenal success when others didn't. The young man said that he attempted to baptize every person whom he met. He said that if he knocked on the door and saw a man smoking a cigar and dressed in old clothes and seemingly disinterested in anything, particularly religion, the missionary would picture in his own mind what that man would look like under a different set of circumstances. In his mind, he would look at him as clean-shaven and wearing a white shirt and white trousers. And the missionary could see himself leading that man into the waters of baptism. He said, when I look at someone that way, I have the capacity to bear my testimonies to him in a way that can touch his heart. We have the responsibility to look at our friends, our associates, our neighbors this way. Again, we have the responsibility to see individuals not as they are, but rather as they can become. I would plead with you to think of them in this way. Brethren, the Lord told us something about the importance of this priesthood that we hold. He told us that we receive it with an oath and a covenant. He gave unto us the instruction that we must be faithful and true in all that we receive, and that we have the responsibility to keep this covenant even unto the end. And then all that the Father has shall be given unto us. Courage is the word we need to hear and hold near our hearts. Courage to turn our backs on temptation. Courage to lift up our voices in testimony to all whom we meet, remembering that everyone must have an opportunity to hear the message. It's not an easy thing for most to do this, but we can come to believe in the words of Paul to Timothy. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of the Lord. In May of 1974, I was with Brother John H. Groberg in the Tongan Islands. We had an appointment to visit the King of Tonga. <laughs> Big fellow. <laughs> and we met with him in a formal session. We exchanged the normal pleasantries. However, before we left, John Groberg said something that was out of the ordinary. He said, your Majesty, you should really become a Mormon, and your subjects as well, where then your problems and their problems would largely be solved. The king smiled broadly and answered, John Groberg, perhaps you're right. I thought of the Apostle Paul before Agrippa. I thought of Agrippa's response to Paul's testimony. Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Brother Grover had the courage to bear his testimony to a king. Tonight, there are many thousands of our number who are, who are serving the Lord full time as his missionaries. In response to a call, they've left behind home, family, friends, and school, and have gone forward to serve. Those who don't understand ask the question. Why do they respond so readily and willingly give so much? 
our missionaries could well answer in the words of Paul, that peerless missionary of an earlier day, for though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. The Holy Scriptures contain no proclamation more relevant, no responsibility more binding, no instruction more direct than the injunction given by the resurrected Lord as He appeared in Galilee to the eleven disciples. Said He, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. This divine command, coupled with this glorious promise, is our watchword today. As it was in the meridian of time, missionary work as an identifying feature of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Always has it been, ever shall it be. As the prophet Joseph Smith declared, after all that's been said, the greatest and most important duty is to preach the gospel. Within two short years, all of the full-time missionaries currently serving in the Royal Army of God will have concluded their full-time labors and will have returned to their homes and loved ones. Their replacements are found tonight in the ranks of the ironic priesthood of the Church. Young men, are you ready to respond? Are you willing to work? Are you prepared to serve? President Sean Taylor summed up the requirements. The kind of men we want as bearers of this gospel message are men who have faith in God, men who have faith in their religion, men who honor their priesthood, men full of the Holy Ghost and the power of God, men of honor, integrity, virtue, and purity. Brethren, to each of us comes the mandate to share the gospel of Christ. When one lives in compliance with God's own standard, those who in our sphere of influence will never speak the lament. The harvest is past. The summer is ended. And we are not saved. The perfect shepherd of souls the missionary who redeemed mankind gave us his divine assurance. If it so be that you should labor all your days in crying repentance unto this people and bring his heaven be one soul unto me, how great shall be your joy with him in the kingdom of my Father. And now if your joy will be great with one soul that you brought unto me into the kingdom of my Father, how great will be your joy if you should bend many souls unto me. Of him who spoke these words, I declare my personal witness. He is the Son of God, our Redeemer, and our Savior. I pray that we will have the courage to extend the hand of fellowship, the tenacity to try and try and try again and the humility needed to seek guidance from our Father as we fulfill our mandate to share the gospel. The responsibility is upon us, brethren. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. John 7, 25-36 Then said some of them of Jerusalem, Is not this he whom they seek to kill? But lo, he speaketh boldly, and they say nothing unto him. 
do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? Howbeit we know this man whence he is, but when Christ cometh, no man knoweth whence he is. Then cried Jesus in the temple as he taught, saying, Ye both know me, and ye know whence I am, and I am not come of myself, but he that sent me is true, whom ye know not. But I know him, for I am from him, and he has sent me. Then they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him, because his hour was not yet come. And many of the people believed on him, and said, When Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than these which the man, this man hath done? The Pharisees heard that the people murmured such things concerning him, and the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. Then said Jesus unto them, Yet a little while am I with you, and then I go unto him that sent me. Ye shall seek me, and shall not find me, and where I am, whither ye cannot, thither ye cannot come. Some people heard the Savior's teachings and believed that he was the Messiah. The Pharisees, knowing that Jesus was helping the Jews to see the truth, sent officers to arrest him. Jesus told them that soon they would seek him, but not find him, for where I am, ye cannot come. Then said the Jews among themselves, Whither will he go, that, he, that we shall not find him? Will he go into the dispersed among the Gentiles, or the Greeks, and teach the Gentiles? What manner of saying is this that he said, Ye shall seek me, and shall not find me, and where I am, thither ye cannot come? The Spirit testifies of Jesus' ministry in the temple. Water was used as an important symbol during the Feast of Tabernacles, and the Savior used this symbol to call the people to believe in him as the Messiah. The most renowned and anticipated ceremony of the feast was the daily procession, during which an appointed priest drew water from the pool of Silo Siloam with a golden pitcher and poured the water into a silver basin at the base of the temple altar, along with the morning wine offering. During the last day, that great day of the feast, after the crowds had celebrated the final pouring of the water, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. His words are a fulfillment of the prophecy of Zechariah 14.8, that when the Messiah comes, living water shall go out from Jerusalem. <clears throat> John 7.37-53 In the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture say, hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. The Savior taught that when someone believes in him, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. The phrase suggests that the living water will be within the believer. It will not be poured out by a priest on the altar as was done at the Feast of Tabernacles. It will arise and flow miraculously from within the believer. This metaphor aptly describes the gift of the Holy Ghost. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was promised unto them who believe, after that Jesus was glorified. In John seven thirty nine, we read a parenthetical comment from John explaining that the living water, the Savior mentioned in John seven thirty eight, refers to the Holy Ghost, whose main mission is to testify of Jesus, of Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ. The Savior's imagery of living water drew upon a long Israelite tradition that water represented important spiritual truths. In the arid climate of the ancient Near East, access to water was crucial for survival, and the scarcity of water made it both a valuable resource and a powerful symbol. The Lord saved Israel in Horeb when Moses miraculously brought forth water out of a rock. The Old Testament prophets Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel used water as a symbol of the Lord's spirit, provident care, and healing power. The Savior's promise that those who believed in him would at some future time have living water within them reflected the fact that the Holy Ghost was not yet given. For some reason not fully explained in the scriptures, the Holy Ghost did not operate at the in the fullness among the Jews during the time of the during the years of Jesus' mortal sojourn. Statements 
to the effect that the Holy Ghost did not come until after Jesus was resurrected must of necessity refer to that particular dispensation only, for it is abundantly clear that the Holy Ghost was operational in earlier dispensations. Furthermore, it has reference only to the gift of the Holy Ghost not being pr present, since the power of the Holy Ghost was operative during the ministries of John the Baptist and Jesus. Otherwise, no one would have received a testimony of the truths that these men taught. <clears throat> Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said, <clears throat> Of a truth, this is the prophet. Others said, This is the Christ. But some said, Shall Christ come out of Galilee? Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the sea of, seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? So there was a division among the people because of him, and some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. Then came the officers of the chief priests of the Pharisees, and they said unto him, Why have ye not brought him? The officers answered, ne Never man spake like this man. Then answered them the, the Pharisees, Are ye also deceived? Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed on him? But this people knew no, the, but this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. Nicodemus saw unto them, he that came to Jesus by night, being one of them, doth our law judge any man before it hear him, and know what he doeth? They answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. And every man went into unto his own house. <clears throat> 